Uh, our first scripture reading this morning is in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. It's on page 1496. The record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah. His mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amenadab. Amenadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Solomon. Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David is the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And now, Moving to the Old Testament, <clears throat> Ruth, uh, chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 17, uh, pages 415 to 17. If you recall from last week, uh, chapter 3 of Ruth, uh, we started out thinking perhaps it was going to be R rated. Um, because uh, Naomi instructed Ruth to uh, go to the granary where uh, Boaz had had fish dinner, had a few drinks, and he had gone sound asleep. He instructed her to go in and uncover Boaz's feet and lie down next to him. Well, it turned out to be PG-13 worst <laughs> because when uh, Boaz woke during the night, he just simply patted Ruth on the back and said, your Prince Charming in the form of a kinsman redeemer will be coming soon. So, starting chapter four. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Boaz went to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders in town and said, sit here. So they did so. And then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling a piece of land to belong to our brother, Emily. I, and I thought I should bring it to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of the people seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth, the Moabitus, and you acquire the dead man's uh, widow in order that you maintain the name of the dead on his property. At this, the kinsman said, then I cannot accept it. I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, the party took off one sample and handed it to the other party. This method was a method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed the sample. Then Boaz, an 
announced to the elders and all the people, today you are the witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Emelech, Kilon, Kilion, and Moan. I have also acquired Ruth, the Moabites, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead of the property that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all of those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home, like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephraim and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore so to Judah. So <clears throat> Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. And she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to you. For this day has the Lord has this day not left you without a kinsman in the evening. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given him. Then Naomi took the child in her life and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they have called him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So ends the reading of this holy word. mentioned in his introduction to this passage, we saw that Naomi recommended to Ruth a plan to encourage Boaz to take on the responsibility of kinsman redeemer. In a middle of the night exchange, Ruth asked Boaz to take her under his wing. Boaz then reveals that while he is indeed a kinsman redeemer, there was another person who is a closer relation to uh, Naomi than Boaz, and that he is in line to be the kinsman redeemer. Now, Boaz then says, if this nearer kinsman redeemer decides to redeem Ruth, then fine, he can do that, everything's cool. Otherwise, Boaz will marry her. Chapter 4 starts with Boaz waiting at the city gates. Now, unless you know Old Testament history and the way that the towns are laid out, it might be easy to overlook the importance of waiting at the city gates. You see, the city gates were the town's version of City Hall or the Hall of Justice for us. The town elders would gather at the gates every morning, and should there be some legal dispute, the elders would be available to settle it. And should there are also in that culture, there was a high rate of illiteracy. Therefore, writing contracts just didn't work very well. So the elders would also be witnesses and notary publics to any business transaction. Boaz is waiting at the gate this morning, hoping to catch this nearer kinsman redeemer and present to him, in front of the elders, the situation that Ruth finds herself in. When the person Boaz is looking for comes, he calls the person over 
to and invites this person to have a seat with him. Now, one thing that is worth noting in this little exchange, we never find out the name of this nearer kinsman redeemer. Notice that the story tells us that Boaz calls him over, not by name, but by saying, hey friend, come here. Now let's think about this for a second. You have a relative calling another relative by friend and not by name. How unusual is that? And as I was reading the commentaries, it was kind of interesting because some of the commentaries hinted that our English translations are taking a taking uh, Boaz's Hebrew term and lightening up, it up a little bit. Some people argue that the Hebrew word could even be translated as, hey, so-and-so, come over here. What's up with Boaz calling him friend instead of calling him by name? Well, it was a tool being used by the narrator of this story. He is purposely doing everything he can to cast this nearer kinsman redeemer in bad light. In that modern language, it would be similar as if I said, there is a person here who shall remain nameless. It's basically the same thing going on. As soon as I say, as soon as, as soon as I say, he shall remain nameless, most of you are probably going, hmm, what did this person do wrong that we're going to keep him nameless? <clears throat> After getting the attention of the other person, Boaz then calls not for one of the elders, but for ten of the elders to come and witness what is about to take place. Again, looking back at some of the history, the biblical scholars are telling us that it is obvious that Boaz is trying to make this deal as public as possible, as there was no need to have more than maybe one or two elders come and witness this. But Boaz is calling Ted. The reason why he's doing this is he wants to have it be well known throughout the community what took place should this nearer kinsman redeemer decide to renege on his moral duty to uh, redeem Ruth. With the two parties to the action in place and the crowd of ten uh, elders witnessing this exchange, Boaz explains to the other person that Naomi has some land that she is selling. Now to the reader of this story, that's going to catch us all by surprise. Because nowhere before this point in the story have we been told anything about land that Naomi may own and is trying to sell. Biblical scholars, as biblical scholars are likewise, uh, excuse me, biblical scholars are also at a loss to give any definitive explanation about this land that Boaz is now springing on this nearer kinsman redeemer and on the reader him, his or herself. The most prevalent explanations are that either Elimelech had sold the land just prior to leaving for Moab, or perhaps what's happening is that the nearer kinsman redeemer Noticing that uh, Elimelech is no longer in Bethlehem, but in uh, Moab, decides that he's just going to go ahead and take care of the land while uh, Elimelech is away. And Boaz is saying, you know what? It's now time to pay Naomi for the land that you've been using for the last 10 years. Boaz tells the kinsman redeemer Either redeem the land yourself, or I will do it. At first, the kinsman redeemer looks and goes, hmm, some land? Oh yeah, no problem. I'll redeem the land. Uh, 
That sounds good. After all, he knows that since Elimelech has no male heirs, when the year of the Jubilee comes up, he would end up uh, inheriting that land from Elimelech anyway. Why not just go ahead, pay the price, have this become official now? After getting the commitment from the relative that he would redeem the land, Boaz, in what might be similar to uh, the old Columbo detective TV show, you, some of you remember Columbo, he would finish his questioning, start walking away and go, oh, one more thing, your, your kinsman redeemer. The one more thing is when you redeem the land, you are also going to be redeeming Ruth as well. Huh. That changes the calculus for this nearer kinsman redeemer. If he redeems Ruth and she should have a son, that child, not his family, would be heir to that land. As the nearer kinsman redeemer says in verse 6, redeeming Ruth would put his own personal estate in peril. Instead of doing the morally correct thing, this nearer kinsman redeemer changes his mind and goes, you know what? I just cannot afford this uh, redemption price. Whereas, you go ahead and redeem the land. In this exchange, we see two di different choices that we often have to make. Do we do what is the right thing to do, regardless of the cost to us, or do we do what is maybe legally permissible because this nearer kinsman redeemer did not have to redeem Ruth. It was just part of the tradition and the uh, leading of the uh, Torah that requires him to do this. But does he do the morally right thing? Or does he do the bare minimum because it's financially expedient to do that? The nearer kinsman redeemer decides that he is going to take the financially expedient approach instead of doing what is morally right. When we get down to verses 9 and 10, we see Boaz repeating to the elders the term of the agreement reached between this unnamed person and Boaz. Then in verses 11 to 12, the, the elders confirm that yes, they heard the agreement, yes, they are witnesses, and then they bless Boaz and his newfound wife, asking that they be as prosperous and as fruitful as Perez, who helped uh, grow the country of Israel into a mighty nation. As we as we see in the uh, New Testament reading that Dan read, Boaz, as a result of taking root, ends up becoming the great-grandfather of King David. And then as we know from reading Matthew 1 during Christmas time, King David becomes in the direct line of descendants into uh, Jesus himself. Then as we move to verse 13, we are told that as soon as Boaz and Ruth got married, the Lord enabled Ruth to conceive, and she had a child. That child's name was Obed, as uh, Dan read in the New Testament passage, Obed fathers Jesse, who fathers King David. As we come to the end of this chapter in our sermon series, let's summarize for a moment what we have learned from the book of Ruth. From the very beginning, Ruth showed that she had the moral character to do the right thing regardless of the cost to herself. 
She was a faithful wife. Then when her husband died, she became a loyal daughter-in-law to Naomi. And then even when Naomi went back to Bethlehem and released Ruth from her obligation as a daughter-in-law, Ruth goes, oh, no, no, no. I'm coming with you to Bethlehem, even though that was a huge risk for Ruth to do. After all, she's going into a foreign country with no noticeable way of supporting herself or her mother-in-law. And yet, she decides that she's going to do the right thing and continue with her mother-in-law. We then get introduced to Boaz, and we find that Boaz also is a man of high moral character. When he finds Ruth gleaning in his fields, he goes above and beyond what the law calls for and provides for Ruth and her mother-in-law by telling his workers to protect Ruth and also to purposely leave more grain behind than what would normally be left behind. As a result, Ruth and her mother-in-law have food available for them. Later, when Ruth confronts Boaz with the fact that he is a kinsman redeemer, Boaz does not duck the responsibility like the nearer kinsman redeemer did. As a result of both Ruth and Boaz's faithfulness, the Lord was able to bless them. Even though God's name is rarely used in this book, we can see his hands working behind the scenes in just about every part of this story. When the time was right, God ended the famine in Bethlehem, and Naomi realizes it's time to go back home. When Ruth starts to glean for food, she ends up unknowingly gleaning in the field of Boaz. Boaz just happens to visit his field that day at just the right time to see that Ruth is gleaning, discovers who this young foreigner is, and then takes action to enable Ruth to glean safe, safely. Are these coincidences? Absolutely not. All of these were scenes where God is working his will behind the scenes unseen by the general public. When we go through our lives each day, let us be uh, looking for God's hand and operate God's hand operating in our lives, even if it's not real obvious to the outside world that it's actually God behind all of these events. Finally, each one of us are frequently presented with opportunities where we have a choice. When we face these choices, what are we going to do? Are we going to show steadfast love like Ruth and Boaz did and do the morally correct thing regardless of the risk to ourselves? Or are we going to play it safe and do the bare minimum that the law requires us to do? Brothers and sisters in Christ, may we be people who do what the loving thing requires us to do, regardless of the risk. Amen.